that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. In the first place, what is patience and comfort? Other translations, your Bible might read something like endurance and encouragement. One Bible says, now may the God who provides endurance and encouragement, etc. Patience or endurance is steadfastness. It is the ability to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. So when Paul describes God as the God of patience, he's describing him as the God who is able to bless us with the ability to endure difficulty, to endure trying circumstances without giving up, without quitting. That's patience. What is comfort or, uh, or encouragement? It is lifting up of another spirit. It is, in, uh, we might call it emboldening or consoling. So here we see that God is the God who helps his people bear up under difficulty and lifts up their spirits. The Bible is clear. You don't have to live very long until you realize that life is filled with difficulties, that the world is full of discouragements, and we need help from an outside source, a source outside of ourselves to give us patience, to give us comfort. And the Bible is telling us that that's exactly what God provides for his people. How does God provide that for us? A couple of things. In the first place, look at Romans 15, verse number 4. And it won't be on the screen, but in your Bible, Romans 15, verse number 4. And notice that scripture, one of the scriptures that was read for us in this context this morning. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, you might have hope. And that's not just the same words in English, that's the same words in Greek. So as Paul is writing this, as the Holy Spirit is inspiring him, carrying him along to write this, he already gives us part of the solution. The scriptures provide the same thing that God provides us, comfort and patience. So if you look at the Bible and you think about, well, how do the scriptures provide me with patience? How do the scriptures provide me with comfort? There's a lot of things we could think about. But if patience is the ability to bear up under difficult circumstances, do we have any examples of that in the Bible? Think about Joseph and how he goes from being sold into slavery by his brothers to being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife to being overlooked in the jail and how easy it would be to give up. But the whole time he stays there, he keeps his faith in God and he's eventually exalted to He's eventually exalted to Pharaoh's right-hand man. Think about Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our ultimate example. How when he was cursed, he didn't curse. When he was reviled, he didn't revile. Think about those 12 bumbling fellows we know as apostles that followed him around everywhere he went for three years. And notice his love, his tenderness, his care for them. The scriptures empower us to be more patient people. They give us that example. They teach us how to be patient. Think about comfort. Aren't there comforting verses in the scriptures? I don't know about you, but I've got a couple verses that I go to when I have a hard day, when I'm going through a hard time. And I can say them in my mind, and they help me. They give me comfort. One of them from Psalm 46, that reminder to be still and know that I'm God. When God says that, and I know I don't have to try to figure it out. I don't have to scurry. I don't have to worry. I can trust that God will take care of it. There's all kinds of scriptures we could go to, but I wonder if sometimes we miss out on this. That when we are in situations where we need more patience, in situations where we need comfort, when we need encouragement, we can't forget to flee to God's word for refuge. That maybe that is the very tool that God is going to use to make us more patient people. That's the very tool that God's going to use to comfort us in our difficulties, his own word. And we might cry out to God and say, God, I need more patience. God, I need to be comforted. Why aren't you acting? And he might reply, hey, I've sent you 66 books full of things that can comfort you and encourage you and help you be patient. Go to that. Seek them out. Read them and allow my power to be active in you through my word. God also provides patience and comfort to us by seeing us through the difficulties of life. And the Apostle Paul is very clear in 2 Corinthians 1, if you'll turn there with me. The Apostle Paul is very clear that he and his fellow apostles or his co-workers were in a situation, we don't know all the details, but they wanted to die. 
and they were certain that they were going to die. I mean, it was so hard that it spared even life itself. This difficulty, we don't know specifically what it was. It was so intense, so difficult. But notice how the Apostle Paul says that God helped them through it and, and what it meant to them. Beginning in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Paul saying we went through a difficulty. God was there with us in the difficulty, giving us comfort, so that now when you go through a difficulty, we can help comfort you. Verse 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. When you suffer for Christ's sake, when you suffer in Christ, and you know what Jesus has said about suffering, what Jesus has said about the difficulties of the world, how Jesus himself had to endure the same things, doesn't that give us some comfort, some consolation, some encouragement? Verse 6, Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so you also will be partakers of the consolation. What's Paul saying? When God in his providence has us go through difficulties, God in his presence is giving us comfort. And notice what he says beginning in verse number 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble with which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, though that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us in whom we trust, that he will deliver us again. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf, for the gift, the gift granted to us through many. Paul's saying that God saw them through the difficulty for this purpose, so that they could rely more on the comfort that only God can provide. Nobody in this room, I know we got some smart people in this room, I know we have some strong people in this room, nobody in this room has the ability to raise somebody from the dead. Only God can do that. And notice what Paul says, we despaired life itself, we were certain we were facing death, what was God's point in that? What was God's purpose in that? Paul says, so that we would learn to rely not on ourselves, but to rely on God who raises the dead. God gives us comfort. God gives us patience by seeing us through the difficulties in our life. But going through those difficulties, we need to make sure that we seek him and rely more on him and less on ourselves. Back to Romans 15, we're going to ask this question. What happens when we have the patience and comfort given by God? Think about this prayer. May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's Paul's specific request? What is he saying the God of patience and comfort will do for his people? Notice back in Romans 15, and we should keep in mind the context of the book of Romans is Jews and Gentiles struggling to get along. That's the context of the book of Romans. There's an emperor named Claudius who barred all Jews, exiled all Jews, kicked out all Jews out of Rome. And while the Jews were away from Rome, the Gentiles and the church continued to multiply. They continued to obey the gospel. They became the elders, the shepherds, the deacons, the preachers. And when the Jews, even the Jewish Christians, were allowed to come back to Rome, now they have churches overrun by Gentiles. And they're thinking, there's no way that it's God's will that these dirty, low-down Gentiles are running his church. So Paul writes the book of Romans in part to address that problem. But look at Romans 15 specifically and how the God of patience and comfort empowers Christians to get along together. And that's what Paul is really praying for. That's what he's getting to here. Romans 15. Notice what happens when, when we have the patience and comfort given by God. In the first place... We are empowered to selflessly help others in their weaknesses. Look at Romans 15, verse number 1. In the context here of verse number 5 and 6. 
Romans 15, verse number 1, when we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. That word scruples, there's a footnote there, weaknesses. Now when we see a weak person, we have two options. A, a brother in Christ who's weak in the faith, a brother in Christ who's struggling. We really have two options. The first is, hey, that's not something I would ever struggle with. I'm not going to stoop down to that level. Good luck. Hope you figure it out. And another option is, though I am strong, and though that's not something I struggle with, because you're struggling with it, and you're my brother in Christ, I'm going to do what I can, within reason, to help you. And that's what the Apostle's saying here, that we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the weaknesses of those who are weak and to help them. But if I'm not a patient person, if I'm discouraged, I'm not going to want to help people in their weaknesses. Notice in the next place, if we have the comfort and the patience that's given by God, we are empowered to live a life of service to others. Look at verses 2 through 3 of Romans 15. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, that is leading to building up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Right? Notice what the apostle is saying here. That when God gives us that patience, when God gives us that comfort as the God of patience and comfort, we are empowered to live, not for myself, not for what I want, not for what I get, but I'm empowered to live for the benefit of other people, to live so that I can please my neighbor for his upbuilding, so that he can come closer to God. And didn't Jesus teach us to live that way? That's what Paul is saying in verse number three. Who did Jesus live for? He didn't live for himself. If Jesus lived for himself, he never would have left heaven. Jesus lived to help other people. But when I'm impatient, it's hard to help other people, isn't it? That guy who's in the car in front of you, going 20 in the 55 mile per hour zone, don't you want to just get out of your car and kindly help them with all of their problems? I wish he would pull over so I could get out of my car and help him. And that's probably not what we're thinking. When we're discouraged and we feel like people have slighted us and we haven't gotten what we deserve and life has been unfair for us and nobody sees all the great things we do, are we willing to help the person who's struggling with a hard time? Well, if I help them, nobody will see it. It doesn't even matter. That's where the God of encouragement, that's where the God of comfort, the God of patience steps in and says, with my help, you can be the person I want you to be. That we rely on the patience and comfort that comes not from having everything our way. That's a great way to live a comfortable life. Hey, I get everything I want. That's a great way to be patient. You don't have to be patient if you get everything you want as soon as you want it, right? But if I rely on God to bless me with patience, to bless me with comfort or encouragement, now I can be of service to other people. I had a stepdad growing up that whenever I got impatient, which was all the time, he used to tell me patience is a virtue. I didn't know what that meant. I went to public school. I don't know what virtue means, right? Patience is a virtue. What is that? But as I got older, I got to see. Think about the people you look up to. Jesus being the chief among them, was Jesus a patient person? Absolutely. Is God patient? Yes. If he wasn't, none of us would be here. God is a patient God. And it's him and him alone who can empower us to be patient, who can empower us to be comforted no matter what life throws our way. When we have the patience and comfort given by God, we are empowered to be united as Christians and to glorify God together. Look at the verses on the screen, verses 5 through 6. This is Paul's specific request. May the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes when we lack unity within the church, it's because we've not allowed the God of patience and comfort to change us. We want things done our way as soon as possible. And if they're not, there's going to be problems. That's not a patient approach. We're so discouraged by things that didn't go our way that we can't possibly join hands with one another to work for God to glorify him. 
right? The God of patience and comfort, one of the ways he blesses us with patience and comfort is by helping us in our lives to focus less on ourselves and to focus more on other people. Why is it when you're waiting in line, let's say you're 30, 40 people deep in a line, you're not happy that people are getting the thing you're waiting for before you. You're just mad that you're not getting it before them. You see, the God of patience, the God of comfort helps us to, to really transform our thinking, to transform our mind, to let Christ be our example in his selfless love that he had for others. Notice verse 7. When we have the, the patience and comfort that God gives, we are empowered to get along with one another. Look at Romans 15, verse number 7. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Notice that. Remember, you've got these Jews and these Gentiles who are not getting along, who are fighting, who are not united. And Paul says that the God of patience and comfort can bless you. In verse 7, therefore, receive one another, welcome one another, just as Jesus welcomed us. Jesus welcomes us into his church, those of us who are saved, who have put him on in baptism. He welcomes us into our church, into his church, fully knowing all of our faults, fully knowing all of our flaws, fully knowing all of our sins, fully knowing everything we've ever done wrong, everything we will ever do wrong. But he welcomes us anyway. He receives us anyway so that his Father can be glorified. When we're blessed by the God of patience and comfort, we welcome our brothers and sisters in Christ. We receive, live together with, bless our brothers and sisters in Christ because I don't live for myself. I'm not about getting what I want as soon as I want it. I've been blessed by the God of comfort and patience. So if you're struggling to endure a difficulty, if you're feeling like you want to quit, if you feel like you're all by yourself, uh, we could say the same prayer that Paul prays here that, you need the God of patience and comfort to bless you. And those of us here, if, if we serve the God of patience and comfort, and if he blesses us with patience and comfort that comes from him, that comes from his scriptures, then we will be able to minister to those who are struggling with situations that require patience, situations that require comfort. But we're going to have to get together. We're going to have to receive one another, just as Christ received us. Romans 15, verse number 7. People will get on your nerves. When they do, try to think about all the times you've gotten on God's nerves and how he blesses you anyway and how he loves you anyway. And let that empower you to extend that same grace to others. We need the God of comfort and patience. We also need the God of hope. We need the God of hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Before we get there, the context here is Jesus is the hope of the Gentiles, is the hope of the nations, Everybody in every country of every ethnicity, their hope is Jesus Christ. The Old Testament looked forward to this. Jesus' death uh, uh, proved it. And now we can bask in the hope that God's given us through his Son. Look at Romans 15, beginning in verse number 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. So there was a promise made to the patriarchs of Israel that from Abraham's loins would come a man who would bless the entire earth, that Abraham would be the father of many nations. And Paul is saying Jesus had to be in service to Jews in order to fulfill these promises, to fulfill these prophecies. But these prophecies and promises were not for Jews only. By fulfilling those promises and by blessing the Jews, God also blesses the Gentiles. Look at what the Bible says there in verse number 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. A quote there from the Old Testament. Psalm 18, verse 49. Look at verse 10. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. From Deuteronomy 32. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. God was always looking forward to this, that all nations everywhere would have a reason to praise God, would have hope in God. And again, Isaiah says there in verse number 12, quoting from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he 
who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him, the Gentiles shall hope. And notice the prayer we have from Paul in Romans 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing more important than hope. The author Dostoevsky is credited with the quote, to cease to have hope is to cease to live. You need something to look forward to. You need something in the future. The future often gives us worry, but it also gives us hope. It gives us joyful expectation. And we spend our lives trying to fill our calendars with things to look forward to. Maybe it's an anniversary. Maybe it's a birthday. Maybe it's retirement. Maybe it's a vacation. Maybe it's a holiday. We all have something on our calendar we're looking forward to that's making us excited, that's giving us hope. But ultimately, hope doesn't come from those things. Hope comes from God. What is hope? Hope is fundamentally looking forward to something with some reason for confidence, respecting fulfillment. That's the definition of that Greek word there. It means not just that I'm looking forward to something, but I'm looking forward to something that I'm confident will happen. And that's what God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ. But how does God give us hope? Again, look at Romans 15, verse 4. Part of the way God gives us hope is through the scriptures. Look at Romans 15, verse number 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Again, remember, what is hope? It's something to look forward to. Nobody gives us something to look forward to the way God does. You ever looked forward to something and it came and went and was relatively disappointing? Happens all the time. The things that God gives us to look forward to will not be disappointing. If he says, put this on your calendar, we can guarantee because of him and who he is that it will happen. Think about some of the things the God of hope has given us to look forward to that we can read about in the scriptures. The God of hope has given us the promise of a hope of an incorruptible, undefiled, unfading inheritance preserved for us in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4. God has provided us something to look forward to, the hope of spending eternity in his presence without any sin, without any death, without any tears, without any pain, without any sorrow, while he makes all things new. Revelation 21, verses 3 through 5. God has given us the hope of a bodily transformation when Jesus returns. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. He's given us the hope of resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 22. He's given us the hope of death being swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. He's given us the hope of inhabiting a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1. God has given us so much to look forward to because he's the God of hope. And it's not wishful thinking. It's not, well, man, I really hope heaven is real. I really hope I get to go there. Nearly 2,000 years ago, on a Friday night, a man had died on a cross and was placed in a tomb. And when they went to go see his body on Sunday, it was not there. And anything you will go through in life will not change that fact. That on that Sunday morning, Jesus of Nazareth was fully alive. And that's why we can know, not not guess, not wish, not think, we can know that what God has promised us will come to pass. That it's not pie in the sky. That it's not wishful thinking. As sure as that tomb was empty on that Sunday morning, that's how sure it is that God will give us what he's promised. Not because we deserve it. Not because we earned it. Not because we're worthy. But because he is that good. Now notice here the God of hope. Notice this prayer. What happens when God gives us his hope? Notice this text. Now may the God of hope fill you 
with all joy and peace in believing. What happens when we have the hope given by God? Well, we have all joy. That's what the Bible says. Paul doesn't pray, hey, I hope that God gives you some joy. I hope that God gives you a little bit of joy. The prayer is for Christians to have all joy. When you have something to look forward to, you are able to be excited. You're able to rejoice. And God is saying, as the God of hope, I've given you so much to look forward to that in the meantime, you can have all joy. That's why Paul can say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, because whatever circumstance you go through does not negate what God has done and what God will do. When we are empowered by the God of hope, we're empowered to have all joy. More than that, we're empowered to have all peace. When you know everything is going to work out in the end, you can have peace. When you know that you're striving and your conflict and your struggle and all of that, that God's going to redeem that, you can have peace. Notice what the God of hope does. He fills believers with all hope, with all peace. But notice we've got to do something. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. We've got to have our faith. We've got to, as much depends on us, grow our faith. Because if we don't believe that God is able to do these things, we won't have hope. We won't have joy. We won't have peace. Thankfully, God has given us enough to rightfully place our faith and our trust in him. So the Bible tells us this prayer that God of hope will fill us with peace and joy in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have time to look into this as much as I would like to. But to abound in hope, it means to have enough with some left over. It means to be rich. Sometimes this word is translated in the Bible as rich, to be rich in hope. What does that mean? It means you have so much. You don't have to worry about where your next meal is going to come. You have so much, you could give some away, and I would even feel the loss. He says, God can give you that much hope. That the things that happen in this life don't diminish it. That the headlines and the news stories and the the losses, though we mourn, though we grieve, though they are upsetting, they don't touch the hope that God has promised us and offered us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And when you look into the ministry and role of the Holy Spirit in sealing believers and intercessing on their behalf, interceding on their behalf to God the Father, that it's the Holy Spirit's work, his ministry, his power that allows us to have that level of hope. The problem is sometimes we completely cut ourselves off from the resources that God is offering. But when we're struggling, we need to go further into the grasp of God. We need to spend more time in his word. We need to spend more time in prayer. We need to ask others to pray for us. We need to go closer to God, not further away, so that he can help us to abound in hope. Lastly, the God we need is the God of peace. Do we need peace? There's nothing that robs us more of hope, more of joy, more of comfort than a lack of peace. Everything in your life could be awesome. You could have the best job, making the best pay, driving the best car, living in the best house. And if you go home to a family without peace, it means nothing. In fact, the Bible even talks about, in the book of Proverbs, how much, with a lot of contention, is not as good as a little with the fear and peace of the Lord. We understand that. We seek peace. We do all kinds of things to get peace. Certainly this world needs peace. Peace of mind, peace with each other, peace with God. A lack of peace is disastrous. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 48, verse 22, that there's no peace for the wicked. God is the source of peace. Any peace that is to be had is found in God. What is peace? It's a state of concord, a state of well-being. It's something that if you don't have, you crave, and something that if you're something that you're willing to give anything to maintain. How does God give us peace? As the God of peace, God empowers us to have peace with him, with each other, and inwardly with ourselves. Nobody else, nothing else can give us the peace that God offers us. 
Think about this, the peace that God offers with himself. If you know the Bible at all, you know that sin causes a lack of peace. We already read, there's no peace for the wicked. So when we sin, when we're in sin, there's enmity between us and God. There's conflict. We're his enemies. And usually, you know, if there's going to be peace, the person who's offended the other is the one who's going to go and make the peace. But this time, God makes the peace. We read in Colossians 1 verse 20, that Jesus Christ purchased peace with God through the blood of his cross. The God of peace gives us his olive branch, his son Jesus on the cross, and says, if you're washing this blood, you can have peace with me. We're friends. We're not enemies. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 verse 1 that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does God supply peace? Well, he supplies peace with him through his son. There's no other way. But God also supplies us and gives us peace with each other. Peace with one another. Jesus reconciles all believers, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.16, to God in one body through the cross, putting to death the enmity. That in the church, in the body of Christ, people who are usually at war with one another can be brothers and sisters. The only way to do that, though, is to have our minds renewed by the scriptures and not think according to the flesh, not think according to our cultures. There are malevolent forces in the world. There are, you know, spiritual places of power and wickedness that would have us be at each other's throats constantly. That would have us know no peace. And only Jesus Christ can bridge that divide. Wherever you are in the world, it's not just an American thing. Wherever you are in the world, there are groups of people who don't like each other. And there are wars that have been fought for years and years and years, centuries, decades, longer, because people just can't get along. And you would think that, maybe some of us would think, well, if we've been trying to get peace with each other for so long and haven't been able to do it, maybe we need some greater resources. Maybe it's not humans that can guarantee peace, but it's God himself through his Son. And that's what he does in his body. That people, no matter how long the feud has been going on, that people, no longer, no matter how long they've been at each other's throats, in the body of Christ can have peace with each other. Because they're not living for themselves, because they've been made one through Jesus Christ. In the first century, it was Jew and Gentile. And that's, I think, what Paul's getting at when he prays in Romans 15, 33, Now the God of peace be with you all, not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles, but them, dwelling together, that God can make them one. And wherever you go in the world, it's true that God can make two, especially in a few, two, one. Whether it's Jews and Gentiles, whether it's blacks and whites, whether it's Ukrainians and Russians, whether it's Greeks and Turks, whether it's whoever it is, if you're going to have unity, if you're going to have peace, it will be by coming to one another through Jesus on the cross. And not having just false peace. Hey, you stay over there, we'll stay over here. There'll be, you know, something between us and you can do your thing, we can do our thing. That's not the peace that God's talking about. In Ephesians 2.16, he reconciles them together in one body. And it doesn't matter if my grandfather hated your grandfather and your grandfather hated my grandfather. If we are in Christ, you and I are brothers and sisters. And it doesn't, it doesn't take away what's happened. It doesn't take away the conflict, but it does do this. It provides a means of peace where there never has been before. And that's why God is the God of peace. And that's why we need to pray for peace. We think peace is achieved by people in a room signing a document. Peace is achieved on a field with people killing each other. Peace is achieved in here. And when it's achieved in here, then we can see it in the world. We need God and his power and his gospel and his son to reach to the places of this world where there is no peace. And only then can we hope to have peace. It's Jesus' way that teaches us in Romans 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. 
Only God can help us do that. Only Jesus can show us that way. God gives us peace with him. He gives us peace with each other, but he also gives us internal peace, peace of mind. Think about what the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, where instead of being anxious and worrying and filling our minds with these thoughts, we can put those things on God. And by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, the Bible says in Romans, sorry, Philippians 4, verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it, you can't get it, it transcends our ability to comprehend it, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How is it that in the middle of the storm, while the disciples are about to die, that Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat? Jesus had peace because he knew the God of peace because he is the God of peace. When we have the peace given by God, we're empowered to have access to the throne of grace. We're empowered to be a peacemaker and share that with others. We're empowered to have a peace that transcends all circumstances. What do we need? We need patience. We need comfort. We need hope. We need peace. That's what we need as individuals. That's what our families need. It's what our community needs. It's what our state needs. It's what our nation needs. It's what the world needs is to know and to be in relationship with the God of comfort and patience and hope and peace, to come to him through his son, Jesus Christ, to receive these things. What do we need? We need God. No amount of human scheming, no amount of human effort, no amount of us trying to figure it out by ourselves is going to be able to accomplish what the God of patience, comfort, hope, and peace can accomplish. And that's why it's so difficult, because we have to get to the end of ourselves and deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And then we can have the patience, the comfort, the hope, the peace that God offers through his Son. And then those of us who are Christians, who have these things, are empowered to minister to others to help them be patient, to comfort them, to help share with them the hope that God gives, to be peacemakers, just as Jesus described members of his kingdom would be. Maybe you're going through something this morning and you have no patience. You have no comfort. You have no hope. You have no peace. There's one source you need to go to. It's not in any self-help book. It's not in any 12-step program. Ultimately, those th- though those things might be helpful, ultimately, these things only come from God. So the invitation this morning is to take whatever's robbing you of patience, whatever's robbing you of comfort, whatever's robbing you of peace, whatever's robbing you of hope, to take that thing and to come forward and to say, God, I know that you are able I know you're the God of patience, you're the God of comfort, you're the God of hope, you're the God of peace. Please, Father, bless us with these things. We need them, and we know they only come from you. You can't know peace, you can't know hope until you know Jesus. That's why he came. So give us life, and to give us life more abundantly. Maybe you feel like you're missing out on that abundant life. Look, even if you've been baptized... Even if you come to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, it could be that there's something in your life robbing you of these things God wants you to have. Let us pray for you. Let us help you. That's why we're here. If you have a need to come forward to embrace the God that we all need, I hope you will, while we stand and sing.